Welcome, 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 everyone. I hope my audio is working here. I just switched my headphones. Ash, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone. As we get started and as just as we uh, let everyone trickle in, let us know in the chat box where you're from. I'm from Toronto. I'm from Lucas Walker from Gorgeous. Ash is from, and is Ash or Ashley? I've called you both. Anyway, I've seen both. I go by Ashley mostly, but my friends typically call me Ash. And my email is ash at Trustpilot, so it just makes it easier. But. Well, then let's go by uh, by Ash. The, the email says Ash. The signature says Ashley, um, as long as it's not uh, something something weird. I think it's all good. So let us know where you're watching from in the comments. And today's Thirsty Thursday is all about uh, reviews and that's what Trustpilot does and reviews are just such an integral part of that customer journey whether it's reading a review before you buy it we were just talking about uh, a store row of concepts who's who's a Trustpilot customer and reading the reviews of furniture that you're looking at because you can't go sit on all the furniture right now so if this is your first your first Thursday Thursday it's meant to be a casual hangout uh, if you want, you can come up on stage with us. You can join us if you're listening to the replay afterwards. Thank you so much. Feel free to hit up either of us with uh, with any questions. I'm sure you can find Lucas at Gorgeous or Ash at Trustpilot. Uh, and we really want to make it casual as well. So we'll be sharing some insights and best practices that we have, as well as some of the questions that you asked uh, coming in. But we could have done that and pre-recorded that. What really makes it fun is uh, if you have anything to add, add it in the chat box. Let us know in the polls, and we can even invite you on stage on air with us. So if you do want to come on in, let us know, and we can get you up on stage. So, Ash, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and trust Pilot? Sure. Thanks, Lucas. Really excited to be here. And as Lucas mentioned, I really do want to keep this more conversational than anything rather than stand up here and tell you all about Trust Pilot. Um, but just kind of to give oh, you a quick um, kind of high level overview. So, again, my name's Ashley. I have been with Trust Pilot for over four years. Um, so, have a lot of insights around best practices for review management, reputation. Um, as well as a lot of your traditional digital channels as well uh, when it comes to search marketing, SEO, um, conversion rate optimization. Trustpilot really touches a lot of different channels um, and different areas of the business. Um, so, you know, as we're kind of going through some of this stuff, keep those areas in mind and feel free to raise your hand or jump on in, onto the stage with us and we can talk on any of those specific topics. But um, yeah, a little bit about myself. Prior to getting into technology, I actually come from an arts and design background. So um, I created my own uh, business when I was younger. It's you know, screen printing workspace. We used to sell products online for the arts industry. And we did courses and functioned more or less as an artist gym. That's still there today. Um, and then moved on over into, into tech into the world of sales and then into partnerships. And so now I oversee the partnerships team. Um, so we work with uh, technology providers, the e-com platforms and digital marketing agencies as well. Um, so who is Trustpilot? We're the largest global on online review platform. I'm based out of New Jersey and out of our New York office. We've got an office in Denver. We're globally headquartered in Copenhagen in Denmark, which is a really awesome city. I don't know if any of you have ever been, but very cool, very, fun to visit. Um, and so what Trustpilot does is there's actually two sides to our business. So for consumers, first and foremost, we are a global online review website. So you as an individual who, in your case, Lucas, looking to buy a sofa potentially from Rogue Concepts, can go to trustpilot.com, search for uh, reviews on Rogue Concepts and read or write reviews about your experience there. And then for brands, we provide business tools to help them to proactively collect reviews from their customers, be able to respond to those, and then be able to weaponize those reviews in some of those channels I mentioned earlier by showcasing them on your website, in Google, on your paid ads, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and so what, what makes us a little different, I know that, that there's, I would say it's a, not a crowded space, but there's a lot of other players in the reviews space. 
And so what makes us unique is that for, for us, we are as a brand and as a, as a company, our mission is to be the one source of truth that you can come to and trust that those reviews are authentic. So in some cases, like we even go the, the extra mile and showing off like, how did that review get on that website? Was that reviewer invited by the business? Um, did, they, did that person come to our website organically to write the review? Um, were they invited via email? So there's like a lot of kind of transparency that we embrace as part of, as, as part of our program. Um, I think that's really important as well as you mentioned transparency and it's a question that comes up with reviews all the time and I think that as we were talking pre-show about it, but it was just such a good segue, when it comes to reviews, what are some of the best practices with uh, everyone always wants 5,000 five-star reviews, thumbs up, perfect, but as a buyer, I don't trust something that has only five-star reviews because I just assume that it's fake. So, I mean, in terms of authenticity, but also best practices for what converts uh, and having that trust, and which is why uh, Trustpilot has it in the name, what are some of the, the best practices with that in terms of having reviews, but also having some not so five-star blowing smoke up, up your you-know-what uh, types of reviews. <laughs> sure, yeah. I think, you know, in many cases, um, a lot of brands will want that five stars. Like, we want to be a five-star brand. We want to show off our five stars. We are a five-star brand. I'm sure you are. But, you know, the you want to show that um, your reviews are authentic. And, you know, Trustpilot's brand mark associated with your reviews, we hope that helps to give some authenticity there. Um, but, you know, embracing some of those negative reviews, and I'm not saying take that negative review and place it on your homepage and, and have it screaming at new visitors that are coming to your website, but um, that's kind of the benefit of being on an open platform where like on trustpilot.com, all of your reviews will be there, whether they're good, bad, or ugly. Um, but the best thing that you can do is respond to those reviews. You know, we're in e-commerce. We don't have the luxury uh, that a brick and mortar store does of being able to have that kind of face-to-face -face engagement with their customer. Mm -hmm. So responding and providing feedback or resp providing a response to people that took time to give you feedback is an opportunity to humanize your brand and give your brand a voice. And so mm -hmm. in the case where you have a negative review, we all know shit happens. Like we know stuff comes up and like the question is, how do you handle that as a brand? Mm -hmm. So a negative review can not only one showcase your dedication to your customers, but two, create the more, create that, um, the more likely more, create that customer to be more likely to come back to you another time. Um, so. Yeah. And I think that it's, uh, one of the best performing entertainment segments that there is, is celebrities reading mean tweets about themselves. And I'm surprised that more brands don't do that. Just reading their negative reviews because it'll get your happy customers and advocates on your side, especially some of those outlandish ones that are just people who just are trying to get, get a, a free item or whatever it happens to be. And it's funny that you mentioned the brick and mortar, uh, Example, going back to furniture, I was in a Lazy Boy Furniture Gallery just killing time one day, and there was a bunch of dust on one of the chairs, and just it looked terrible, especially for a premium product. And so I took a picture of it, and I think I was going to tweet it out or something, and then they kicked me out of the store. Ah. <laughs> so now that I'm actually buying furniture, I'm not considering Lazy Boy because that's my only experience with the brand. Whereas, and we see this all the time with the gorgeous on the ad comments when somebody says, oh, I haven't received my order yet. By taking that time to respond, hey, I'm we're so sorry, but due to COVID, due to this reason, we we were a little bit slower than we would have liked shipping out orders. Even when it's not your fault, it's just eating a little bit of that crow and being like, hey, you know what? Sometimes shipping across the border, stuff gets lost. We found your order. We sent you an email to confirm that it's you. Uh, just reply back to that, then we'll refund your shipping. Sometimes acknowledging that just goes such a long way. Totally. I mean, what we're also seeing as best practice, so um, being the nature with, uh, sorry, being an open platform and having all of our brands have a profile page on our website, um, 
a section, there's a sidebar where you have the opportunity to customize that information. So as best practice, what we're actually finding is businesses that are thinking ahead are placing like updates about what's going on internally with and how COVID has impacted their business. Because at that point, you know, reviewers will typically come to Trustpilot to write a review because they're usually a polarized experience. It's like they had a really stellar experience, they want to tell the world, or they had a negative experience and they're like inflamed and need to rant. And so the capturing that opportunity, that like micro moment when somebody's like, I need to, I need to tell somebody about this, um, humanizing the brand and saying, hey guys, you know, business is not as usual right now. We're really sorry. Like, please contact us here and we do everything that we can to help you. Or here's what we're doing to help our customers during COVID. Um, mm -hmm. The proper expectations and trying to try and humanize yourself there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, a really interesting transition to our next uh, topic, which I know that you have some really interesting data. We have access to sales data. We did a webinar yesterday with Clavio sharing some of our sales data and surveys. But because you're so centralized with, um, and for anyone listening to the replay, actually a little heart for Clavio. Shout out Rich, Joe, Mary, uh, and everyone on the, at the Clavio team if you're listening. But um, with that, you because people can come to Trustpilot, you have a lot more traffic and a lot more proprietary data. So I'd love to dig into some of that data that you have in terms of how web traffic and, and sales were impacted during during COVID. And if you have any slides and you want to share, by uh, by all means, go ahead and uh, share them. Sure. Yeah, I don't I don't necessarily have slides on some of the the site impact, but we do have a lot of resources. So we're making our data public. Um, mm -hmm. So we've been publishing some of these trends that we've been seeing on our website, on our blog. Um, but, you know, in terms of just from our perspective, you know, initially when COVID kind of happened, like early March, like felt like the world froze, right? Like we had to like pack up our office real fast and move and go remote. And it just felt like decisions just froze. You know, our sales teams, I think they they felt that hit where everyone was just like, I can't make any big decisions right now. The world is, you know, in a crisis. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we do have a freemium model. So that makes it easy for anyone to come in and claim a profile page if they've, you know, if they've received reviews, they can respond and engage to that. And they can use any of our e-commerce plugins to automate review invitations. You just get limited access to our business tools. Um, and then our business tools, we've got, you know, a bunch of different ways that you can manage and share those reviews with different feature sets that you can add on. Um, but what we found is that, you know, we closely monitor the traffic to our site because we're mm -hmm. top 1% of traffic websites globally, like toot toot, that's a nice little stat, but, um, we do see a ton of people turning to our, our website to read reviews about brands. And so, you know, we did see a little bit of a dip um, in the first quarter where uh, not as many people, I guess, were shopping and therefore maybe not relying as much on reviews. But now with COVID, like more people are shopping online than ever before, which has made reviews even more critical than ever before. Because we have some some surveys that we've done and some, some reports that we are running right now to better understand what is the perception of the average average person on like you know, online scams, um, decision-making process before purchase. And like, we found that trust is on the decline. Like, people are very like, you have people that are shopping online that have never shopped online before. Um, mm -hmm. And so making sure that as a brand that you're paying really close attention to those search terms, like what do you look like when you search for your business name or your business name plus reviews? Mm -hmm. um, People are searching for that. They don't or have... competitor versus your business name. Mm -hmm. totally. Or competitor reviews plus your business reviews. And I think it's important to really realize that it's very easy to get siloed into what you can see. But take a step back and as a, as a user, and we're all consumers, how do we shop? How do how does our family shop? And I think it's interesting as e-commerce entrepreneurs to take that step back and really evaluate how um, – how customers are are looking for us. And I think it's very easy to get lost in the details that we care about and not think about it from a customer perspective. 
For sure. Yeah, I, I know that there is there's a lot of ways somebody can find out about you. Um, once you're once they're at the point though that they're searching for your business or they're searching for your business name plus reviews, like you've spent so much money on that moment. Mm -hmm. whether it's through branding, whether it's through paid ads, you know, whatever the case might be, like that's such a critical moment that if you're dropping the ball because your reputation isn't up to snuff, like just throwing money out the window. That's like our whole value prop for why we work so well with search marketing agencies is because that that buy moment is so pivotal and so expensive mm -hmm. there. Um, so Lucas, one of the things that we were talking about earlier is like, what are some best practices for how yeah. you like accelerate some of those channels, make sure some of those search channels are really clicking and firing. And so yeah, what are, I'd love to um, just hear some of those best practices for if somebody's just getting started with reviews, maybe they need to adapt. Um, really, what are those best practices beyond just collecting as many reviews as possible? Sure. And also for, for everyone listening, I would be happy to, if you're brave enough, fire up my screen and do some initial digging and make some recommendations as to like what I would suggest that you could do. Um, and just walk you through how some of the things that, that we typically look at as potential pain points that reviews could help solve. So feel free to jump in, raise your you hand. You know what? We, we mentioned them earlier. I know that they're they're a customer, but let's take a look at Row of Concepts. I think they've got a beautiful site, nice premium. Let's let's take a look at, at them as just a, a general e-commerce store. If, if you're comfortable using a, uh, a client. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to um, just fire up my screen here. Is that working? Yeah, I can see the uh, the Google slide deck there. All right. Um, let's see. So first, I just run a quick rep, quick uh, branded search. So mm -hmm. I hope you all are doing this, but quickly search for your business name. Now, I think Rove has done a really good job of what we would refer to as Barnacle SEO. So Barnacle SEO is making sure that you have a presence on uh, large websites that have like really strong domain authority. So that's like make sure you have a LinkedIn account, a Twitter account, um, Facebook, Instagram. In their case, they're on House um, and and like Trustpilot that would rank really authoritatively for are a brand. You using a VPN? Oh, okay. No, it's coming up as a lot of Canadian things because they are Canadian based, which is really cool. I thought uh, maybe I had sent the link to their Canadian website because I saw Globe and Mail and then Pinterest.ca there. But um, but great point on the Barnacle SEO of really being on those those key those key websites. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a good defensive strategy so that like you know news happens, things happen, scandals happen. Like it's you think about it as being more proactive and that you're building up the walls of the fortress by having a strong presence on websites that rank really well. This way, if like mm. a local news site pops up, it's not going to be the bane of your existence, you know, for the rest of your existence. Right, so then I just ran a quick search for Rogue Concepts views. And so we've got some product listing ads. Now this is these star ratings. These are all these kind of like social cues that will help to accelerate performance on ads. And that's both on a product level and on a Google ads level as well. So we are one of the licensed third parties with Google. So we are able to syndicate and share our reviews with Google so that you can qualify for these stars that show up in your ads. And it's a great way to accelerate the click-through rate, which could help with your quality score, which could help with performance, which should actually wind up lowering your cost per click and your cost per acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, really a no-brainer. If you're not working with Trustpilot, find a review party that has that licensing agreement um, so you can get those, those ads, those stars to show up on your ads. And so there is a sweet spot. I know one of the things that we were talking about earlier is like, you know, when is a five-star review no longer 
authentic um, and what happens if you only have like, negative or you only you don't have any negative reviews. There is a sweet spot in terms of like star rating. So for Google, in order for your stars to show up on your ads, you have to have a three and a half star rating or higher um, and 100 reviews in total over the last 12 months. But the most trustworthy score, and there's some studies out there, is actually to have a rating of like 4.2 to 4.7. It's not five stars. Five stars is like unbelievable. Like we don't, people don't believe that you only have five star reviews. Yeah, like if I showed you a product and it, and I said it has 300 million five star reviews, not a single negative review, is that believable? Not really, because I think people know that just sort of that one to two percent will will just be negative no matter what. Yeah, and like you don't, you also don't want to necessarily show off reviews when it's less than three and a half. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, why Google has decided three and a half or bust. But and it's almost that, like, if it's less than three and a half, it's not even worth serving up because people won't click it anyway, which goes against what Google really wants. Agreed. Um, so, yeah, this is their, their profile page. I came here through um, the reputation search. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is kind of like what it looks like as a consumer. You can actually break it down to see reviews by like star rating. What we actually find is that people tend to gravitate tend straight to the one star reviews because they want to know all of the terrible things that could possibly go wrong. Mm -hmm. What I mean is that there's a miss here. These guys aren't responding to reviews, which to me does is doesn't build a whole lot of confidence as a as a shopper. Um, Lucas, I'm not saying don't buy their couches. <laughs> but they look beautiful. No, but it's true, and it really does tie into uh, into gorgeous and something really interesting that we're experiencing. And I, I've got some charts here, but I can just I can describe them to you, and you'll you'll get the picture. The number of customer support inquiries since COVID is actually up 50, percent but the number of agents and so the number of people who are able to manage those those inquiries hasn't gone up 50 percent so you want to do everything that you can to reduce the number to reduce that friction and responding to the negative reviews is just such an easy way to do that because now it's i know well some people just say negative things but if i see the brand responding it does really make a difference in terms of being able to say okay you know what that was the exception to that and it was resolved and it also gives me more confidence as a buyer to be able to uh, just say, well, you know what, at least if something does go wrong, they'll be there to sort it out. A hundred percent. And also there's a, there's a risk mitigation element to that, um, that may be an added benefit that you may not even consider is that the average person who has a negative experience, and I'm going to take a little liberty with how many people they actually wind up telling, but it's something along the lines of, for every negative experience, that person will tell 16 other people. Oh, wow. And yeah, right. And so if you think about it on a human level, it's like we're looking for a response. We're looking for validation. Like we need to like tell people that I had a bad experience and like how am I going to handle that? But if you as a brand, you're using a platform like Gorgeous to get promptly, give a prompt response and just sort of stay on top of some of, some of these things, um, you know, you're you're kind of like intercepting that behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and so, in terms of the the walkthrough there for Rove, what else could they they consider? And I see that you've got a few a few tabs there, and I'm really attracted to that Vegas.com reviews tab. I'm just curious what people are are saying about Vegas right now. Yeah, so these guys. Um, the reason I had this prepared is because um, they have done a good job of using this panel over here on the right mm -hmm. to share what they are doing to handle like cancellation or booking requests. Um, as you can imagine, people had to make some pretty drastic changes to their travel plans. And yeah. so putting proper expectations here has helped Vegas to mitigate some of that like negative feedback they may potentially get as a result. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that makes makes a ton of sense. 
I think that that's a great example of really being pro uh, proactive. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been it's been interesting to watch. It's something that our customer success team has been encouraging our customers to do, um, just mm -hmm. as that like final opportunity to say like, hey guys, listen, this is what's really going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And was there anything else that you wanted to add in there before we get into some of the Q&A? Um, I think we could probably we could probably jump into it, to be honest. I think there's, you know, some other best practices that I'd be happy to advise on in terms of like using reviews on your website, how where and how you can place them. Um, but and I'm also open to doing that kind of like free form if somebody wants to raise their hand and have me run through their site or run through their, their search presence, I'd be happy to do that as well. But otherwise we can jump into the questions. Yeah, absolutely. So the first question while, while you've got it open there, I think is a great one. And then we'll jump to uh, Kodiak's question since Kodiak is, uh, has joined us live. So the first <laughs> question comes from Claire uh, and she wants to know how to manage reviews in Trustpilot to optimize the quote comments and if needed to delete the review. And I think that the review deletion is a really interesting topic because part of the, that trust is that you can't just cherry pick the reviews and say, we're gonna hide all of our negative ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so first and foremost, like we, we don't allow businesses to one, cherry pick or two, delete a review just because it was negative, but that being said, we do have really tight user guidelines and company guidelines around who can leave a review, when they can leave a review, what they can write about. Um, so for instance, if that review that you've received happens to be a negative score and you feel like that business or that customer was not or had not worked with your business, you can ask them to validate themselves and provide some kind of proof of purchase to one, just authenticate the fact that they were a customer of yours. Um, and if they broke any of our user guidelines, um, some of our, our AI should be catching most of that. So things like defamation or uh, fraudulent, you know, uh, foul language um, will automatically be flagged. But if it, for some reason, squeaked through that, then um, you can report the review for whatever reason it was that they broke the guidelines and then you don't, it, we, will, we'll, we will remove it or ask them to update the review. Okay. Um, yeah, in terms of like, you know, the, the fear of the negative reviews, like I said earlier, like in terms of placing them on your website, you don't necessarily need to go the extra mile and place the one star reviews on your website. The widgets that we have um, available, which are basically like copy and paste of some code you can put on your site to showcase and pull in reviews from your pro profile. Um, you can filter based on star rating, um, but your your score will be um, whatever is on Trustpilot, and it will link back to your profile page. So we're giving them a door to go through to read the full story. No, I think that's that's really smart. And I mean, in terms of highlighting the reviews on your own website, what are some of the best practices there that you've seen of pulling some of that content? Um, pulling some of that content in with regards to either on the product display page, on a page, featuring and highlighting reviews, even using some of that, those reviews in your user generated content. What are some of the, some good examples that you've seen of, of customers doing that and some of the ways that you can capture that with Trustpilot? Definitely. Um, I could probably talk on this topic for a while, but I'll keep it brief. I think, you know, we all, know where in the customer journey on our website we're seeing the biggest conversion drop off. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know you can, there's some great A-B testing tools out there if you don't already have them. Um, our widgets are capable of running their own split tests, but try adding a review, you know, customer testimonials or reviews into those conversion points. And you know what we'll see is like a landing page, for instance, that's a click from paid search where I need to put my personal information in to book an appointment or to request a call or a quote, like mm -hmm. hesitation point. So having that like social proof there can help to drastically increase conversion rates. Um, check out. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's so, it ties in so much to customer experience and customer support. If somebody's call, chatting and asking about something, and let's just, we've been talking about furniture, 
let's keep talking about it. Maybe I tied into road concepts and I say, Hey, I've, I've gained a bunch of weight during quarantine. I'm a little bit uh, heavier set than usual. Will your couch break down? And you can say, well, here are some reviews that mention high density foam. You can see that the couch won't break down and start sagging after, after three months. 100%. 100%. Um, we're, we're, I, while we're on furniture, like before I got into partnerships, I was actually part of our sales team and furniture was like my bread and butter. Uh, yeah. And one of the things that we see really commonly in that vertical specifically is like just what you said, like, you can't touch the couch, can't sit on the couch, you're shopping online, like you don't have that in-store experience. Um, in that industry specifically, I think a lot of brands suffer from negative reviews associated with delivery. Mm -hmm. I feel like the pain point. And so often with furniture, it's a third party delivery. You've got uh, like greasy dudes coming into your place and you're just like, uh, am I supposed to tip them? It feels more like a bribe. I just, that's, but that's that touch point of what they associate with your brand. And you're like, what the hell did they do on my sofa before it even arrived? Yeah, so thinking about like how you can collect reviews to talk about that story as a brand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's different ways that you can trigger a review invitation to be sent out to the customer. Typically, it's like post purchase and it's uh, ETA arrival is supposed to be, you know, seven to 10 business days or accommodate whatever your standard shipping is. But, you know, for a brand where it's trying to talk and showcase, their reputation and their service around a specific area of the business like delivery, triggering an invitation to go out to the customer once the delivery is complete and in the body of the email saying, how was your experience with our delivery drivers? You're encouraging the customer to write about that experience to help build trust in your brand, in industry, in a pain point in your industry that's very common. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I think that that's just such a good point too. Um, and I, I think that another interesting example, do you have any sort of hotels or um, I see a real estate uh, associates or associate coming in. I see someone else from a little boutique hotel here in Toronto. What about more experiential reviews? Do you have any best practices or insight into, into that? Mm, so, Yes, service related businesses are actually some of our best. So I'm trying to think of a couple of examples you're putting me on the spot. Ah. Let's see. And I think that while you look that up, I think it's it's really interesting how for a service based business, a really trivial um, item can be what what ruins that that review. And I, I mean, if anyone watches HGTV, people will say, oh, I don't like the paint in this in this place, but they love everything else. It's something that's really easy to fix. And maybe they, they leave a negative review because they had to wait uh, in a line outside because of COVID. And people can be really finicky about that. And it lowers the overall review, but it's really, when you dig into it, it's almost reassuring because it's something like, well, they didn't have an iron there. And it's not, well, why are you bringing clothes that need to be ironed anyway? Haven't you ever traveled before? Like nobody wants to get to their hotel room and start ironing their clothes or get to their, their Airbnb and iron their slacks. Oh my God. I'm like a big user of the iron. Are you? <laughs> oh, see, I, did, I, wear, I wear a lot that of, uh, I, I haven't ironed anything in ages. Uh, and I, like, I always buy non, non wrinkle stuff. Uh, and I try to just avoid it. Like, like the plague. Which yeah, might be an incentive. Hard to, it's hard to avoid when you're doing business travel. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, like you said, there's a lot of reasons why somebody may leave um, a negative review. I think looking holistically at reviews that you've collected is a really nice learning point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like we offer a review insights tool that actually breaks down the actual feedback that's in the content of the email to say, like, this portion of this review is associated with delivery and it's a five it's a positive whereas like you know i could say the couch was beautiful but it arrived late so that's, mm -hmm. there's like two things to learn there it's like you know the cow the product is nice but the shipping has a problem and it will build out like trends for you um 
to say like, hey, you may, may want to take a look at your delivery drivers or your delivery systems. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Use ours. There's you know, just taking your review content out there and really kind of taking a lens to it to see what you can learn about how to improve the business. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And I know that you were searching for VRBO. Was there? Do you have any other um, items that you wanted to to chat about with reviews for more experiences or service based businesses? Um, I think uh, for service based businesses, the the service review just weighs even more heavily. I think a lot of times when people think about reviews, especially being in e commerce, they think product reviews specifically. Um, we do product reviews. I think those are also really important. Um, using photos in those product reviews is also an added benefit to show even more authenticity to those. But as it pertains to service reviews, I think there's a lot to be said about showcasing that um, and making sure that that's present online. Um, if you're a service-based business that has multiple locations, doing like local based reviews searches is also I think something that you should pay attention to because there's other sites like Yelp or like your Google My Business page um, that can spiral out of control if they're not monitored. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, just paying attention to the searches. So let's get into the next question here from Kodiak. What's the best way to encourage reviews when the experience is not is not negative? And so I think that we can really break this down into two two categories. One is when that experience is just what you would expect. I bought something, it came a couple of days later, it was as it was should be. Nothing's nothing remarkable. It didn't need to be. I was just buying some socks online. Um, I think that the other the other one is when somebody has such an overwhelmingly positive review that everything goes super well, how can you incentivize them? And I think sure. that this is really a good question for, for Gorgeous because that's probably how you'll hear about them. Of If they do come in and they're chatting with you one-on-one -on -one and they're in a customer support interaction, even if it's just updating or just asking for an update on their order tracking number, if you see that they've ordered before from your store, but they didn't leave a review, ask for that review while you have them on, 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 the, on the phone or on the chat, wherever they happen to be. If it's just a remarkable review, there's definitely some automations, but you can even, depending on what you sell, if it's a higher ticket item, you can set up some automations to create uh, a ticket and open it up and then manually ask for it, especially if you know that that customer, say, has a good Instagram feed and they're, they take these in photos, you might want to try a little bit harder to gather that user-generated content as well. So those are a little bit of uh, manual and then semi-automated ways. What are some of the ways that you see brands really collecting a lot of reviews? When so before, it's not negative. Yeah, so I think um, you, you touched on a really good point there, like asking for reviews after a customer service interaction is really smart. Um, you have a highly engaged person at that point and usually you just help them with some kind of issue and they're really happy about it. Um, we have brands that actually have their customer service team kick out review invitations after a ticket is completed and they actually tag those reviews with data associated with that individual customer service rep and then um, actually we'll do like bonuses for the top rated rep of the month. So it's a nice way to incentivize your team for top performers and like kind of boost morale across the board. Um, but what we've seen in terms of, you know, encouraging the positive review, like that's something that we have to be a little bit careful about because one, you can offer rewards and incentives for people to write your review. But to mm -hmm. run a client on Trustpilot, we ask that you, in the language when you're providing as incentive or reward, or reward, that you're asking for them to leave you a review. Not a five mm -hmm. review, not a positive review, just write us a review and we'll give you points or coupons or whatever. Um, that does help. In, in some cases, we've seen that even double the review responses just by offering a small reward. Um, but just simply automating and proactively asking people to leave you a review will encourage more people to give you 
feedback. What we actually find is that when you automate your review invitations, they typically come back as four and five stars 85% of the time. Oh, wow. And, I mean, I'm not too, too surprised most people will do that. I have a special uh, disdain. I think that there's a very, very special place in hell for people who leave four-star reviews when everything was perfect. Uh, unless you're a sommelier of that, I think it should be kind of, if everything was good, just go five stars. I. I just cannot stand and I empathize so hard with small businesses and entrepreneurs who are trying so hard to get the reviews and then somebody leaves a four star review and it just says, yeah, everything was good. Really, really enjoyed it. We'll definitely be ordering again. Then, then I asked them for, for the, why, did, why didn't you support that business with a five star review? You, you, <laughs> just, it, dri it drives me nuts to see. A question in the chat from Andy. KRC, not 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 a vowel in sight in that last name, but any thoughts on contacting a user who left a negative review and maybe asking them to either edit it or change it down or have some of that dialogue? And uh, we definitely have some experience with this through Gorgeous, but I'd love to hear your what you see as sort of a, an overarching best practice. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll leave that to you on how you want to handle it, but. Um, I think one is just like making sure that you're acknowledging that there was a negative review. Um, I would be a little cautious of asking them to remove remove it because one that that request is going to be public unless you contact them offline, right? Um, but if you if you respond to them openly in a public forum and you, if you say even if it's nicely like you know this is really damaging our business, like would you mind taking it down or this is not accurate? Um, would you mind? you know, removing it kind of gives the perception that you're looking to sweep the negative stuff under the rug rather than just embracing that negative stuff happens and um, providing some kind of um, solution to it. I mean, that's that's how I would advise approaching it. I think you may be even opening yourself up for additional blowback from the customer to then be even more inflamed at that point and be like, these guys asked me to pull my review down when really like I'm so angry because this happened. You know, so I, I, I would kind of weigh that out for yourself, but that's how I would approach it. Yeah, and I would tend to agree. However, um, I would really approach it of just asking for any feedback or advice on hey i'm really sorry that your experience with with our company with our products with our service wasn't what you were expecting how can we make it better for future guests and hopefully you uh, a future pr uh, purchase from you as well and that's how i would lead that i mean with gorgeous you can set up rules that when a, a review comes in and let's say it's less than three stars it will automatically create a ticket to proactively go out uh, and see that, and I mean, do a, I would do a little bit of due diligence on the person as well. I would give them their name a quick Google, see who they are. Are they someone who seems nice and friendly or do they constantly just leave negative reviews and are they a troll? Uh, if they're a troll, it's not gonna be worth their time. If it truly was a misunderstanding or something happened, then I think that that can be, uh, be a positive as well. But I mean, to your point, like we kicked off the call, that sweet spot is sort of that 4.2 to 4.7 uh, review review ratio. So if you have one to two percent negative reviews, then it's it's probably worth getting more happy customers than trying to change that one negative customer. Yeah, but I mean, like, if you try and resolve the issue, like, you could naturally get them to update the review from a one star to a five star potentially. Yeah, absolutely. But, I'd send them a quick note, but I, I wouldn't lose any sleep over it. And don't feed the trolls. No, as tempting as it is. As, um, I always invite the, invite the trolls to come on for Thirsty Thursday, but none of them none of them want to. I don't know why. <laughs> the last question here, which I think is really interesting, I and I think that we can really answer in two parts. So B two B business selling OEM parts, and this question comes from from, from Mike. So B2B selling business selling OEM parts, is it accurate to believe that store reviews are better than product reviews? Hmm. Okay, well, so I think there's two ways to see value in both. Now, the store reviews are going to build confidence in your brand and your outlet for selling direct to consumer. Um, so 
having the store reviews on your site typically speaks to like the service end of your business, whether that's like delivery, whether that's customer service, whether that's overall brand uh, quality and product quality, whereas the, pr the product specific review will speak specifically around just that one piece that you've sold or that one product item. Um, so if you're thinking about it from like an SEO perspectives, brand and service reviews are going to show up on brand and service related searches typically. Um, the product reviews will also help to boost like the UGC content on your site and on that particular page so that that content will then be searchable by Google and can ultimately help your product be more searchable and more visible to the search engines for uh, related queries. So that could help to increase your awareness there. Um, but they're also great for conversion aids as well. So getting mm -hmm. um, people to feel more confident in the product and and purchase, make the purchase on the site. Yeah, absolutely. And my, my first thought was, store reviews is I think that that's really important on Google and when you are people are doing that branded search and more at the top of the funnel and then the product review as they start to really um, get closer to purchase and closer to to cash because you might have a, a great reviewed store but if the product itself is is trash nobody's going to buy it and at the same time um, if you're selling selling uh, products that have great reviews, but your your delivery and customer support sucks, people won't come come back. And that's a great um, example there that you have up there, Ashley, is the unclean floor scrubber. It can be, again, a B2B product with different reviews. How does it support? Do they, do they service it? So I think it's uh, just to, to really filibust a little bit. I think it's the answer is both. I mean, they, they go in tandem. It's having only one won't necessarily having having them won't necessarily help you more than the other but i think a lack of or negative on one will will hurt you agreed awesome well thank you so much everyone for for attending that goes over uh, all the questions that we had all the data and insights that we wanted to share ash thank you so much for for making time out of, out of your day to to join us where can people find you where can people find trustpilot what else is going on in in your world anything that you want to promote or anything that you want to to shout out the the floor is all yours Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so anyone that is interested in talking more about this, like I am always down to talk reviews. Um, so you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, search for Ashley Hildreth. You can hit me up on email. Um, it's just ash at trustpilot.com. Um, you know, if you're if you're currently a Gorgeous user, there are ways to be able to pull your reviews into Gorgeous so that you can have some visibility when they do happen so we can create some alerts to make sure that you guys are staying on top of it and getting quick response times to your customers that are taking their time to write you feedback. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in using Trustpilot itself, like we do have, like I said, a freemium model so you can claim and use our basic plan for free. But if you're interested in any of our business accounts, we offer free trials. Um, so you can check us out before you buy. And uh, awesome. happy to help support that if anyone's interested. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. We typically uh, wrap these up after about 45 minutes. We actually went a little bit over, but thank you so much, Ash, for, sure. for coming in and par participating. Thank you to everyone else. And if you do have any questions, just reply to that wrap up email that you get. It's automatically generated, but I do check all responses. Uh, and if you like some of what we've chatted about, if you want to see how to do this in Gorgeous, just respond to that email and I'll hook you up with a, a member of our sales team. I'll, we've been really inundated with uh, bringing businesses online during uh, during the pandemic. So I will make sure that you get to that front of that line to get uh, to get a demo and view Gorgeous. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Bye.